Now, as we all suspected, our Range Rover didn't exactly sail through the test, but there were a number of items which didn't actually fail, so that is quite a result. Now, we do have a wadge of paperwork to go through, so it would be quite nice to do that with John himself, the owner of the Range Rover. If nothing else, just to see him squirm, but to be fair, I don't really have the heart to tell him the worst news of all. Now, having gone through the gargantuan job of actually getting our Range Rover to start and drive for long enough just to get it to the MOT station, unfortunately, once it was there, it was still in such a bad condition, the MOT test centre actually refused to test it for the following reasons, and I quote, the test was not carried out under the refusal to test criteria as per the MOT test manual. Item C, the vehicle is not fit to be driven when necessary to complete the test because of a lack of fuel or oil or for any other reason. And in fact, the reason was the vehicle wouldn't start. So I had to pop down to the MOT station to actually bridge the starter solenoid on the starter to get the engine going so we could actually get it into the test center again. Then we had item G, a proper examination cannot be carried out because any door, tailgate, boot, engine cover, fuel cap or other device designed to be easily opened cannot be easily opened. And in this case, both the rear doors and the tailgate couldn't be opened. Well, actually with the tailgate, I'm pretty sure that you can't be shut, but either way, they weren't happy with that. Then finally, we had item H, and that is the condition of the vehicle is such that in the opinion of the tester, a proper examination would involve a danger of injury to any person or damage to the vehicle or other property. And basically the reason for that was a massive excessive leak of oil coming from the engine, and it really is quite bad. So even though I got it running, I certainly didn't stop it leaking. So, despite falling at the first hurdle and being too bad even to test, the chaps very kindly, after a cup of tea and a good little pep talk, did actually offer to go through the whole vehicle and check every single item that would normally be checked on an MOT test. Hence, this rather long list of things that need to be done. So, let's crack on and go through it. Now, John, well, obviously this is the big day. This is where we go through the paperwork from the MOT station. And I should probably point out at this point that the DVSA do rather encourage motorists to make sure that their vehicles are suitable for the road at all times of the year, not just the day they go down to the MOT station. Okay, so the best bit of news I've got for you, congratulations, the vehicle has actually passed. Oh, well done. The emissions. <laughs> Only the emissions. <laughs> so, well, well actually, that's not it true. So, it's the emissions actually passed on. Also, the headlights do work and they are pointing in the right direction and they have the correct beam pattern. Oh, I knew they would. So, that's quite cool. And also, I noticed the clock works as well. So, Gosh. it's not all bad. It's a Range Rover. Well, <laughs> I think that's going to be your comment all the way through, isn't it? So, we have, as you can imagine, a little tiny bit of paperwork. I think it's perhaps been phrased as the world's worst ever MOT failure. Impossible. Well, not really, because actually initially there were at least three things that meant it wouldn't go through even to the test point. So basically the, the MOT tester was in his right, but actually refused to test it because of a number of points. But we'll brush over those. They did very kindly go through the whole list and actually just try and just see what it might actually fail on when we get that far. <laughs> So number one is excessive play in the offside front hub assembly. And number two is excessive play in the near side front hub assembly. So obviously we've got some issues with mm -hmm. the suspension. A little bit of shimming. <laughs> a little bit of shimming. Okay, fair enough. And I guess probably that's to do with all your rough handling when you've been driving around over oh. the rocks and things, I guess. Possibly. Number three is excessive play in near side front track rod end and boot split. And number four is the offside front track rod end boot split. In fact, number five is the steering drag link end joint boot split. So you've got a lot of split boots. Well, let's in a bit of water. What's, what's wrong with that? Well, you should see the state of them. They are quite shocking. So number six is the offside front flexible brake hose is perished, which we kind of knew about a little bit, I guess. Mm. Number seven is the near side front flexible brake hose is perished. So mm. we obviously have problems with our brake flute. Brake to be honest, bear in mind this has got a, s a suspension lift on it. Yeah, changing the brake hoses was something that I had intended doing years ago. Okay, but never got round to it. <laughs> so uh, I wouldn't mind changing well, them. That now has to happen if we're going to mm. get this thing back on the road. And I guess have you considered maybe some sort of braided hoses rather than just something stock? Well, um, I have to look at see what's out there. Really, I think yeah, it's, it's been a while, hasn't it? I guess. Yeah, it's been <laughs> Fair enough. Okay, so number eight uh, reasons for failing. It was an offside front brake discontaminated with oil. 
And the near side front brake disc is also contaminated with oil. And I've noticed actually on the advisory list, this is just all the stuff we're going through that's failed. On the advisory list, I believe it was number, oh, where are we? Number two in the advisory list, the front uh, tractor joints are leaking. So that's obviously the bits that join the wheels to the axle. So I guess that's where the oil is probably coming from. Yeah. yeah. So I need to fix that as well. Uh, we have number 10, the offside rear brake pipe corroded to excess. Number 11, the near side rear brake pipe corroded to excess. And in fact, number 12, both brake pipes to offside front corroded to excess. And in fact, number 13, both brake pipes to near side front corroded to excess. So what have you got to say about that? Yeah, well, a bit of coupon oil. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's going to take a little bit more than that. So obviously, I well, guess maybe, when we get around to doing the breaded holes, yes, maybe, we're going to end up having to do all the brake pipes as well. I, mean, I did fix one so far, so we're already one up, I guess, on that. Just yeah, to well, get I, I've done some down there too, you know. Yeah, OK. Uh, a long time ago again. So number 14 is the handbrake lever not functioning correctly. Well, it's not really uh, working at all. There's a little bit of dirt down there. <laughs> well, I actually tried to clean some of that off, but that's obviously not ideal. So we got rid of that. So now, number 15, the handbrake warning light is on. So even though the handbrake isn't actually working. Actually, you know what that is? I think it's because it kind of springs back up, and that's where the switch is. So I guess that's relatively obvious. Um, number 16, brake efficiency test not carried out. And that's basically because I had to go down to start it just to get it driving again, because on the way there, it seemed to be starting fire. I had to do it again and again and again as it kept cutting out. But obviously, by the time it got to them and it had been left there for a week or so, while well, they kind of built up the courage to actually do the test, it turns out then it wouldn't start on the key. So I had to kind of like short it across the starter motor and the uh, solenoid. They've broken my car. <laughs> yeah, let's say that. OK, so anyway, so there's that issue. So that was one of the problems. So they couldn't therefore, and also they, they couldn't put it on the rollers, so they couldn't even go and drive it on the road because they didn't really deem it safe. So there's that. The bonnet is insecure. I kind of know that. It's because obviously mm -hmm. that catch had to be removed to get in to the bonnet. I haven't put it back yet. So that's actually my fault. The windscreen washers aren't working. So I guess, <laughs> that's, well, at least it was raining, I think, well, you know, so at least some point during its past. Um, the number 19 is offside front windscreen wiper is worn. And number 20, the near side front windscreen wipers are worn. So as you suspected, we are definitely going to have to replace those. Oh. I don't know what to say about that. <laughs> I think it's the least of our worries, probably. Number 21, the offside front tyre cut through to the cord. Number 22, near side front tyre cut through to the cord. Number 23, offside rear tyre cut through to the cord. And number 24, near side rear tyre cut through to the cord. I must admit, the last time this was used off-roading, it was a very flinty, flinty sight. OK. So it, that might have happened then. Fine, so we obviously need some new tyres. Do you have any thoughts on what kind of, you obviously want to go, go off-roady with them still, perhaps? I mean, are they, are they going to be used mostly off-road, a little bit of on-road, or are you going to go really, really full on? I don't know, that's, that's a difficult one to answer, but I think maybe we start thinking about some all terrains. Okay. So that You've got you know, a choice. We've got a choice. Okay, no, cool. That makes sense. Um, okay, so number 25, the excessive corrosion to offside front chassis rigger. I laugh because this is obviously the beginning of quite a long list of this sort of problem. 26, excessive corrosion to near side front chassis outrigger. 27, excessive corrosion to offside rear chassis outrigger. And 28, excessive corrosion to near side rear chassis outrigger. In fact, what they actually said was they were surprised the body was still on it when I turned up. And if I had actually stopped suddenly on the brake test, perhaps the body would actually leave the chassis. I think they're exaggerating. I don't think they are. I think when you look closely, then you can see how awful that is. Are you trying to tell me that I'm going to have to give you a hand to weld this up? <laughs> I, think, I think I'm going to accept your offer. Thank you very much for that. Excellent stuff. Oh, look, here's some more. 29, excessive corrosion within 30 centimetres of the offside front seat belt mountings. We also have the same, obviously, for the near side fronts and the offside rears and the near side rears. That gets us up to 32. And number 33, excessive corrosion within 30 centimetres of rear tow bar mounting. In fact, we say excessive corrosion, corrosion it actually kind of left the building while I was working back there on the fuel tank. Big chunks were falling off, so I wouldn't recommend towing it or, for that matter, lifting it up 
with a telehandle, but let's not tell anybody about that. So, um, <laughs> next thing, where are we? So, yeah, so 34, um, tow bar supports brackets missing. That's totally my fault, as I took them out of the way just to get sure oh. that I could get the fuel tank in, which is lovely and clean and didn't fail any test at all, I might note. No um, leaks? No leaks either. Uh, well, at least not from the fuel tank, certainly from the oil, but we'll get to that. Um, 35, offside rear side light flashing when indicators operated. Probably, in fact, an awful lot of the electrical stuff in this car sprung into life after I'd washed it. In fact, including the interior lights, which are permanently now on, uh, which is lovely. Um, so there's, that could be me as well. 36, near side, rear side light flashes when indicators are operated. So number 37, near side, front side light not working. Number 38, off side, front repeater lamp not working. Number 39, near side, front repeater lamp showing off light. John, it's amazing. Your Range Rover has passed the MOT with flying colours. It was the easiest test they've ever done. And as a prize, they're going to send you on an off-road adventure. In fact, also, they're not going to bother testing your car again until 2040. 40, 40, 40. Finally, number 40, rear number plate obscured. Number 40. Did I miss much? Rear number plate obscured, probably by your tow rope. So that is the entirety of our list of failures. We now move on to a couple of advisory items. This should so, be interesting. <laughs> Quick look at paint. So we've already covered number two, the front tractor joints are leaking. Uh, number three, the steering damper bushes are perished. But we're going to do a lot of work on the steering anyway. Number four, all flexible brake hoses, uh, ferrules corroded. So obviously when we replace those, I guess that'll get done. Number five, near side rear number plate lamp not working, even though it's obscured. Uh, and number six, Perhaps consider an alternative vehicle. Well, there we go. Cheeky bonus. <laughs> I think, well, I'm surprised they even went through this list at all. So at least we now know, officially, this is an epic fail, this vehicle. But I totally appreciate that there is an awful lot of, well, sentimental value wrapped up in this. So I think maybe we should have a little bit of a drink, perhaps something a bit harder than tea, and maybe have a chat about it. Wonderful idea. Who's putting the kettle on? Oh, it's you. Oh, stitched again. <laughs> Well, while John sits in a darkened corner and contemplates the reality of the situation, why don't we have a look at the sheer horror of the work ahead of us? Right, first up is excessive play in the offside front wheel assembly. Right. Oh, that is quite bad. I can actually hear that play. There's also excessive play on the near side front wheel assembly. That's number two. The near side is even worse. I mean, you can really see that movement. You can certainly hear it. Now, the thing is, you can kind of get away with this kind of play for quite some time, obviously, as John has been doing, but eventually something's actually going to give and it's going to get a bit more unpleasant. You don't really want your wheels coming off as you're driving along. So whether it's the bearing or any other parts where that play is coming, you need to sort of get in there and work out what's going on and fix it as soon as you possibly can. But like so many things on this vehicle, it's obviously another big job that needs to be done. Right, number three. So what we're looking for is excessive play in the front near side track rod end, and also the boot is split. Now, on this Range Rover, you've got two steering rods, if you like. You've got one on the front here and one on the back. Now, the one on the front is actually the drag link. I guess it's because it gets dragged around by the steering box. The one on the back is the track rod, and I guess that's because, obviously, when you adjust the ends, you actually change the tracking of your front axle, which is kind of interesting. So the near side, <laughs> apparently excessive play, quite easy to find. I can actually move it with my fingers and thumb, which is quite scary, but also the boot is split quite clearly as well, so obviously that needs to be changed. And that brings us on to number four, which is the offside front track rod end boot split. Well, actually, it's completely missing. So obviously that needs to be put back into position. And then number five is the drag link boot is also split. So clearly that also needs attention. So obviously the steering is going to be wobbling all over the place. Grit's going to be getting into those ball joints, making an absolute nightmare. So probably we'd need to replace all of this just to make sure that the steering actually handles quite nicely on the road and also even more particularly off-road. So number six, offside front flexible brake hose is perished. There's obviously two of them. Oh, they're looking pretty bad. So that's definitely not clever. 
Now, number seven is the near side front flexible brake pipes are also perished. Actually, to be fair, they're not quite as bad as the offside, but still, end of the day, if you're going to change one set, you might as well change all of them because chances are all the rubber is going to be perished in pretty much equal amounts. And obviously, if it really is perished, either fluid can come out or air can get in. Either way, it's not a good thing at all. And at the end of the day, it's the sort of thing that, because it's such a safety feature, even with the twin circuits, you just don't want to mess with that. Now, what might be quite nice, depending on what John decides to do with the Range Rover, it might be quite good to replace these with some braided brake pipes, make it a bit more sporty, make it a bit more resilient to all that off-road action you're hoping it's going to get. So number eight is the front offside brake disc is contaminated with oil. And number nine is the front near side brake disc is contaminated with oil. As we know from the advisories, clearly the tractor joints are also leaking and so they haven't got any protection from the elements. So all that oil is leaking onto the brake disc, which of course then contaminates the friction material. So even if you did have your brake fluid and your brake lines being kind of perfectly secure, your friction material is still compromised, so the brakes will still be rubbish. Well, that all needs to be fixed, and those guys are a really big job. I'm looking forward to that. Right, to the back of the car. Quickly diving to the rear of the vehicle, we have number 10, offside rear brake pipe corroded to excess, and unsurprisingly, number 11, near side rear brake pipe also corroded to excess. Now, unfortunately, there was no mention from the MOT tester about how wonderful the refurbished fuel tank looked, or indeed how shiny the bleed nipples were. <laughs> hey, there we go. Start moving back to the front again of the vehicle. Number 12 is both brake pipes going to the offside front are corroded to excess. And then number 13 is both brake pipes going to the near side front are also corroded to excess. Clearly, I've already fixed that one pipe just there, but there's all the other ones on the vehicle are going to need to be changed. And probably that copper nickel alloy would be a really great solution for that. Number 14 is that the handbrake lever isn't functioning properly. Now, the Bowden cable comes in from inside the car down to here. Now, when I was operating it inside, not much seemed to be going on. It's much the same <laughs> effect down here. The next one, number 15, is obviously something to do with the fact that the handbrake light doesn't go off on the dashboard. That's because something's going on here. Either the mechanism inside here or the Bowden cable itself is kind of getting caught, so it doesn't actually let the handbrake go down. So, again, quite a bit of work to do here. Now, if we end up taking the body off the chassis, of course, we're going to have to separate this part because they go join the two. So maybe then we'll actually find out what's going wrong. Now, what's interesting about Land Rovers is the way they actually operate the handbrake. You can see there's this great big drum here. That's obviously in the middle of the prop shaft. So when you put the handbrake on, it actually locks up all four wheels, which is very handy. Unless, of course, that mechanism doesn't actually work. And that brings us on to number 16, which is basically they didn't even bother to try and do the brake test because of all the other things that were wrong with the vehicle. So we don't even know how badly the handbrake actually functions. Now, number 17, we already know about. The bonnet is insecure. We'll obviously have to break in to our Range Rover just to get the thing started all those weeks ago. Should we say months, in fact? Now, to fix it, it's nice and easy. Just have to do up some nuts and bolts. We'll also have to fix the bonnet stay, which, of course, just fell off when I first opened the bonnet. But then, number 18, the washer bottles, or at least the washer jets, don't seem to work. Now, the washer bottle itself is full of some nice blue colour liquid. That must be a good sign. But clearly, the link between there and the little jets is probably blocked full of algae, dirt, grit. Who knows? It's been sat there for many, many years. Now, a nice pair of easy jobs to do. Number 19, the offside front windscreen wiper worn. You can see that's looking pretty unpleasant. And number 20, the near side front windscreen wiper is one, and that rubber is looking pretty prehistoric, to be honest, so that'd be a nice thing to, I might even let John do that job. Right now, I'll go back underneath the car. Number 21 is the front offside tyre is cut through to the cord. Well, these tyres are in a terrible state, and whether John went off-roading in a slate mine or not, they definitely need to be replaced. But it's a fantastic opportunity to get some really gnarly off-roady tyres stuck on here, possibly even change the wheels. And it's the same story for number 22, the near side front, number 23, the offside rear, number 24, the near side rear. Now, this is where we get to the real meat of the problem. As we know, the underside of this Range Rover is in a pretty sorry state. There probably isn't any part of this vehicle 
where the metal is still really properly intact. And that brings me to number 25, excessive corrosion on the front offside chassis outrigger. Now, the thing is, you can see at the moment that the body is barely attached to the chassis. And obviously to fix that, I really need to take the body off to actually get in there, get rid of all that bad metal, put it all back together again, and then put the body back down again, just to make sure that it's in the right position before we weld it in place. But of course, this isn't the only outrigger where we have an issue. We now have everything else as well. Number 26, excessive corrosion to near side front chassis outrigger. Number 27, excessive corrosion to offside rear chassis outrigger. Number 28, excessive corrosion to near side rear chassis outrigger. Number 29, excessive corrosion within 30 centimeters of offside front seatbelt mountings. Number 30, excessive corrosion within 30 centimeters of near front seatbelt mountings. Number 31, excessive corrosion within 30 centimeters of offside rear seatbelt mountings. Number 32, excessive corrosion within 30 30 centimeters of near side rear seat belt mountings. And that litany of corrosion brings us to number 33, which is excessive corrosion within 30 centimeters of the tow bar or the tow hitch. Now you can see here that the rust has got so bad it's actually kind of delaminated what was left of that steel structure there. You can also see there's more corrosion all over the place just waiting to drop off this vehicle. So I certainly wouldn't want to lift the car with the tow bar. That definitely wouldn't be a good idea. Now that also brings us to then number 34, which is that the struts here for the tow bar are also missing. Well, that's totally my fault. It just made my life a lot easier when I was putting our refurbished fuel tank back into position. Well, I think that's enough of that nasty body work. So now we're onto electrical items. The offside rear side light flashes when the indicators are operated. Pretty much exactly the same problem with number 36, which is the near side rear side light flashing when indicators operated. Number 37, near side front side light not working. Number 38, offside front repeater lamp not working. Number 39, near side front repeater lamp showing a white light. Now, almost all of the issues with the lights are going to be caused by some kind of bad earth. And interestingly, just after I washed the car, many of the things that didn't work started working rather miraculously. So there's clearly some issues I need to be looking at there. Now, something that actually passed was the rear number plate light here, but unfortunately, its little neighbour over here wasn't working, so that's not quite so ideal. The number 40, the final failure on our long list, is actually the fact that the rear number plate has been obscured, presumably by the rope, which I could easily have moved, but chose not to. Well, there we have it. This Range Rover is officially a total and utter basket case and nobody in their right mind would waste the time or the money that it would take to actually get this thing back on the road, let alone restore it. But that's actually not why we do these things, is it? We don't just restore old wrecks because it's the sensible thing to do. We do it because we love it, we do it because we love them. And John certainly has a lot of love for this Range Rover. He has a lot of very special memories wrapped up in it. He has a very strong emotional connection. Now, I asked you what you think we should do with this Range Rover, and you've been very generous with your opinions. You've been quite frank, you've been creative, and you've been merciless. So thank you for all of those. And as always, thank you for your questions and comments. Please do keep them coming. And if you haven't subscribed already, why not? Just push the button. Anyway, by now, hopefully, John will have had time to recover. And it's probably time for another cup of tea and maybe a change of scenery. And I can then put your suggestions to John himself. After all, it is now crunch time for our Range Rover. Do we do it up or do we blow it up? Now, the good news is obviously we now have Paul to give me a hand. Hello, mate. Thank you, sir. Good stuff. Now, now obviously, I don't think we've bitten off more than we can chew with this, but it is a big old task. It is, and it's a lot of work. So why are we doing this? Well, because it's important to John. It's very important to John. So we are going to do this. We are going to make it into some kind of Rat Rover, hopefully. And as I say, the first thing we need to do is take the body off the chassis. Now, obviously, the body is actually held down, well, in some places. Obviously, it's done its best efforts to try and leave the chassis on its own accord just by rusting away. But there are still a number of bolts holding it in place. So we're going to have to undo all of those. But there's also lots of other things we're going to need to do as well. I guess, like steering, presumably steering, that goes from... I, think, I can see the brake pipes going through the inner wings. Yep. So they're going we're to have to, have to do those off. as well. Electrical connections from the bulkhead to the engine. We're going to have to do those as well, of course. Yeah, and I think things like the fuel, obviously we put the new fuel tank, or the new fuel tank in, or the refurbished fuel tank in. Obviously, then you've got the filler neck that goes actually to the bodywork. That's got to come off. And there's going to be a number of other little bits and pieces. But we're going to try and go through all the big bits, make sure those are out the way, and then see what else is kind of holding the two bits together. But again, I don't think it's right that we do just us either, does it? Really? No, we're going to need a hand today. And I think well, the first thing we need to do probably then is actually to degas 
the air conditioning system. Yeah, and disconnect the battery. And disconnect the battery. And we know just the man to do the degassing. The owner of the vehicle, bring on John. Hello, sir. Morning, girls. Well, it's quite lucky that I didn't actually lace this thing with explosives the other day, isn't it, really? Oh, I knew you wouldn't do that. I don't know. So the thing is, when it comes to the AC system, obviously it's been standing around for about, what, 12, 13 years. So what is, maybe it was even 15, was it 20 years? I don't know. Anyway, what's the likelihood of any gas still being in the system? Well, there's only one way to find out, and that's put a set of gauges on it and we'll have a look. OK, and what gas would it be? This is going to be on the old R12. So they're kind of bigger molecules when it comes to refrigerant gas, so the chances are there might still be some in there? Quite possibly, quite okay. possibly. Well, we'll get the car down and then let's crack on. OK. We have pressure. Well, John, that sounds like good news. So, actually, you've got pretty much what a whole charge of gas, or it looks like a fair charge of gas, yeah, nearly a full charge. That is amazing, fantastic. So, that means then, so what gas because presumably now you need to extract the gas and then keep it somewhere safe and we we'll put it back in when we come to do the current. No, this is the old gas, and this has got to be destroyed. So, we take it out and uh, we'll have it destroyed. Yes, and then we're going to put in what? So it's what is it? So you say it's twelve now. So we'll put in one three four A. Is that right for the next one? Yeah, one three four A. We'll change the compressor, um, change the receiver dryer, change the oil, uh, flush out as much as we can. Yeah. I might even think about changing some of the pipes, um, and then <laughs> we are talking about a time sometime in the future, I think. But well, that's good to know. But it's yeah. nice that your AC system is actually, you know, well, as you would hope, in fact, that it's all tickety-boo, no leaks, it's all wonderful. Well, if Paul hadn't pinched the battery, we could have tried it out. <laughs> right, cool stuff. Well, I'll let you crack on, because we need to get some more help into the building. Brilliant. Right. Thank you, sir. So R12 gas was actually phased out some years ago because it was so damaging to the environment. So then it was replaced by 134A. Well, unfortunately, 134A is actually based on a synthetic chemistry, whereas R12 is based on minerals, which means you need different oils and different seals to accommodate it. So that's why John has got so much work to do to actually get this new system back in place and recommissioned, because he's going to have to change an awful lot of bits and pieces. Now, while John is busy vacuuming out all that R12 from the system, I need to think about what's the next stage. Now, handily, John has got this rather wonderful full-size manual from Land Rover about how to do various bits and pieces on his vehicle. But one thing that is totally lacking is actually any information about how to separate the body from the chassis. So we need help from another expert. And in fact, in this particular case, this chap used to work for JLR when these things were actually current. And he does owe me a favour because that Mustang is his. Hello, Adam. All right. <laughs> so, well, what's going on here then? Why is there no information about this in here? Well, when this was a current production vehicle, there was absolutely no necessity to take the body off the chassis for anything, okay. unless it had been in a major accident, okay. and then we would be sending it out to our body shop. So we never needed to take the body off, so why would we put it in the manual? So did you ever actually take the body off a chassis nope. in your time? Never. No, not at no. all? <laughs> no, not ever. So you're going to be really useful with this. So there yeah. must be a couple of top tips there. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of things we're going to have to disconnect just to get that separation to happen. Anything you think we're likely to miss? Yeah, I think it'd be better taking the radiator out. You okay. can do it with the radiator in but I think get the radiator out it's safer it's not going to get caught by anything yeah. things like the, the major the earth lead from the engine yes. to the chassis yeah. things of that nature where it's just going to catch us out just as we start to lift you'll see something oh we've forgotten okay. drop it back down again undo it yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but you know well, in it, that case it should be all plain sailing yes. well that's your job so I think if you crack on with Paul let's get that yeah. radiator out that'd be lovely well, we're going to crack on yeah fantastic <laughs> Hi Paul. Can you get the, uh, the biscuits fan out, I think, first? Yeah, I think they'll be the first, first Alex. practice. Alex! Yep. Even more help, sir. Very good. <laughs> Hello, Alex. Hello. 
Right. <coughs> Can I help? Yeah, first things first, let's get with this lot. Right, see so if we can get this viscous fan off. Here we go. Are you going to be dropping water, Paul? No, I'm taking the uh, viscous off. Mind your feet in a second. Oh, well done. There we go. Just go up a little tiny bit. Now you can't reach. I don't think there's that much chance to come undone, but... Right, well, I'm uh, disconnected here. Oh, there you go. So am I. Look at that. Totally sorted, that one. Oh, you yeah. <laughs> I must got that off. I was on doing that beautifully. So, so what do you reckon? So this is actually now good to go? Almost yeah, we've got to get that hose <laughs> off. This to, um... <laughs> Hang on, we're about to get soaked. So I'm just going to disconnect the bottom radiator hose. It's coming, coming. There you go. Interesting coloured cool. <laughs> <laughs> give, give it a little bit of a clear. Right then, so the next stage, finally, we're at the point where we can actually lift the radiator out of our vehicle. So here we go. Yeah, Okay, ready? <laughs> here we go. It looks like there's a little bit of paper towels being sucked into the fan in the past, which is lovely. <laughs> Look at that. We just let that drain in there a minute. Mm. We've got a slightly smaller one. Oh, okay. well, well. Wow, got look at that. That's a not bit good. More, actually, going to tip a bit more in there. <laughs> <laughs> Put it on his back. Yeah, okay, cool. We've started. I can actually see what's going on now. Oh, look at this stuff in here. Oh yes, trans cooler. Let's not forget those. Now, John, I can see how this was possibly a little bit overwhelming because it turns out it's taking how many years to get this done? <laughs> uh, not enough. I think if we need more people. We need reinforcements. So we've got 12 years of absence. We're going to try and make up for that in a couple of days. I think we are. And there's all these hidden wires. I just found a big earth strap down here. That's the one that Adam was talking about. So I'm just going to um, remove that. Now, I guess, do we think the trans cooler is going to come away with the body? I guess it is, isn't it? Oh, so we probably want to drain that out. Because yeah. that's going to stay, yes. that's coming on here, isn't it? Okay, yep. fine. <laughs> a couple of 8mm bolts down the pipes just to stop it yeah, from dripping on all our heads when it goes up. Are you on earth duty, are you, Paul? I'm taking this earth strap off, yeah. There's another one on the block, this side, that comes up to the coil base. OK, yeah. Just yep. so you're aware of it. Yeah, I'll do that one. I'll do this one and then I'll get on and do that one. Is, is Paul bothering you, sir? Are you worried about your <laughs> precious piece? I think it's worried about the paintwork. Oh. I think that, that may be a worry from an earlier time. You have to think about paint. What kind of colour? Do you want to keep it the same colour or are we going to go something? Well, that's what I keep asking you. Go on, go on, it's going, mate. It's going. It's going. It's going, it's going. It's going. honest. It was going, wasn't it? <laughs> Oh, 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 oh. Yep. Yeah. There we go. Go for that. Right, so now we've got this earth strap. Oh, sorry, you're yeah. still on that one. I'm still on the earth strap. Apologies, that's my fault getting in the way. What about if we do it on this end where it's easier to get to and just lay it over the engine? Yeah. You say it's easier to get to. <laughs> but will it, will it come on done? It will actually, if I spray some, um, some magic on spray on it. It wasn't moving, but it is now. Uh, the penetrating fluid is getting in there now. Alex, you have to close the other one first. Yeah. One for you, just carry on uh, okay. fiddling. Oh. Yep, yep. I'll tell you what we do, we just um, put that back on there. Cool. So how are we doing? I'm just trying to see how the uh, throttle cable hmm? goes on. 
You see that one that twists and pops off. I can't actually see. Want to stand on your bumper, John? Yeah. If it doesn't take your weight, there's something wrong. Can you see? Uh, that plate the other off way. there. <laughs> so at the moment, what we're trying to do yeah. is remove the throttle cable. But there seems to be a, like a hidden clip, so exit. we're not too sure whether we've got to lift the plenum up first to gain access. I'll let you know in a minute. Oh, what do you reckon? See, so there's not this here that's captive, yeah. and there's another one there. Yeah. We undid that. That whole plate right. will move across, okay, and we that's... can perhaps twist it round, and we can get to the clip. Right, let's get a bit of this gear on there. Right, so currently what we've got here is John and Alex are just trying to disconnect the steering. No idea what Adam's trying to do. It seems he's trying to climb into the engine bay and then Paul is just hanging on for dear life. There we go. Yeah, Adam's actually disconnecting the uh, throttle linkage. Ah, OK. Because we can't get the cable off, so we're going to take the whole bracket off with the cable complete. I like your thinking. Oh, yeah. well done. Well oh, done. With, with the bolt? Look at that. I'm no, that is more luck than judgment. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Right. Right, so now John and Alex have managed to yeah. disconnect all of the AC pipes, which is great. The only one that's still connected is obviously attached to the dryer. That goes all the way around onto the bulkhead and then into the evaporator. But obviously that's still part of the bodywork, so theoretically that should separate then from the engine. Of course, the compressor has been disconnected, we're so we're definitely getting it. Now, John, so, so how have you got on? So we're now with the AC, that's definitely all disconnected. The wires are disconnected, pipes are disconnected. That's all done now, is it? Yep, that's fine. Cool, so just come off. So just, <laughs> so just the steering and a whole load of cables. I guess that's going down to the starter motor. And, and again, I suppose you want to go, do you, want to, do you and Alex have a go at trying to get the centre console bits, obviously the controls and stuff, because I'm guessing some of that's going to stay in the car, some of it's going to have to go. Yeah, can do. Smash it. Thank you, sir. I'll leave you with the uh, steering car. <laughs> with that, Ed, I'd like to have a look underneath first. Because we might be able to just disconnect the gear shift oh, that's cable nice off the box without yeah. touching the centre console. Okay. Anybody near the steering wheel? Can be. Wobble it around a bit. Right, so we're all now, good. Now, why have we got two words going to that? It's one just go to the alternator, or... Got your your container for that is in the thing. Oh, yeah. That's that one. Uh, just in the battery. Tray. And the front of the bell. All right, chaps. How are you getting on? Oh, good. So you've now just disconnected the big positive lead that goes all the way to the starter motor. Yep, that's gone. And what about the trigger wire? That's just come off now. Cool. So now that means the engine is actually completely disconnected electrically from the rest of the bodywork. Would that be yep. right? Which is fantastic. And then obviously everything else is disconnected. So pretty much now we're ready to go underneath the car yep. and start undoing things from under there. Vehicle up. Hang on awesome. one minute. Oh, um, if I could just uh, <laughs> extract the brake fluid from the master cylinder. It's a good thought, actually. It's a good idea. Go on, then. It'll save a lot of mist later. Definitely. Well, they can use that container there. Smashing. Crack on. As if by magic, we have one ready. Well, I've removed as much brake fluid as I can from the reservoir. Awesome. So now we can finally lift the car up and start attacking the underside. Wow. There's going to be quite a lot of work to do, isn't there? Oh, there is actually. So you've got obviously the tow bar wiring, all those little bits and pieces, all like the handbrake cable, the speedo cable, I guess all the controls for the from the inside, and I suppose the brakes as well actually and yep. most importantly perhaps all the bolts that hold the body onto the chassis there's probably about 12 of those yeah it? but i think there's only nine left i think the rest have dissolved <laughs> fair enough which is rather fortunate okay and i've also heard a lot of grumblings about the pub so it seems like the boys would like to go somewhere else so i think we should let them go fair enough which means all that work is then a job for another day okay yeah. 
So last time on Workshop Diaries, the guys came round to help separate the body of our rusty Range Rover from its chassis. Right. We started attacking the top side, freeing the engine and connections, starting with safely removing and storing the air conditioning gas, dropping the coolant and removing the radiator, disconnecting all the electrics and heater hoses and the throttle cable, and finally extracting the brake fluid from the master cylinder, which is when the pub beckoned, just as we are ready to start tackling the underside. So today's job starts with raising the car up and getting stuck in. Now, even though it seems like we're halfway, we still do have a ton of work to do. And of course, let's face it, there's going to be an awful lot of rust just raining down from this thing the whole time. So safety goggles on. Right, crack on. Right, well, at the moment, we've got John and Alex trying to sort out how to remove the tow ball, the electrics, all that kind of stuff, and eventually probably the whole thing so we can actually get that away from the body and the chassis. Obviously, we've got here, we've got Adam and Paul are now trying to work out how to disconnect things like the speedo cable, the handbrake cable. There's also going to be other connections, obviously, to the actual gear selector itself, and then even the transfer box, which maybe have to be undone from inside. When it comes to the actual body, trying to separate that from the chassis, we've got a couple of bolts either side here at the front, a bit further down. We've then got two more, one either side here, and then you've got the big outriggers either side, which you already know are pretty rusty. Then we've got some more at the back here, and then finally, we've got the last two all the way down here at the back. So we have got quite a few of those to undo. The trick is gonna be whether we're just gonna to have to cut them off, tear them off, whether they will actually unbolt. But either way, they're gonna come off, and hopefully not too long after that, we should be able to lift the body, prise it apart from the chassis. So let's crack on. Right, boys, how are you doing? You think you're going to come back? You want to go down a little bit? Yeah, I think uh, we need to. Fair enough. <laughs> Just a tad. Yeah. Okay. Just have a little look in. I thought he was going to disappear off to the green room now that we're up in the air. Ta da! <laughs> So hopefully. Yeah. Now the question is, getting that back to or do we actually need that extra bit of length to bring? Oh, see the brake pipes about to shear here. It's about just twisting round and round. So it'll be one of the mini brake pipes right. we'll be replacing. I'd like to try and get it out in one piece of a cook. Can't even see what it is, can you? Is it? Yeah. Okay. Is it 10mm yeah. mud everywhere. And rust. Mud and rust. If only somebody had taken all the brake fluid out of this system. Yeah. If only someone jet washed it properly underneath. Oh, wow. You know. Health and safety. I mean I get I know you did jet wash it. So I guess it was quite bad under here. Well, I only washed, you know, sort of probably six or seven years worth of <laughs> wash. Oh, okay. It's, um, it's proving slightly tricky, this. But basically, the, the brake pipe. So you've got like, the locking nut um, on the top. Oh, of, right, yeah, yeah. Uh, so maybe it'd be better off to have got it undone by the yeah. it's like a caliper. But it's got to that bit where it's just a little bit too tight now. Yay! Was that that dropped off? <laughs> no, I think that might have been the. Um, oh no, I don't know actually. What is it? Something just looks like it. Do you want to grab a nut, get a so we can sort that 9 sixteenths? Uh, uh, it might socket be a. Uh, and a oh yeah, that's fine. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was. Does it need to be a deep? Hooray! Is that one out of eight? It is. <laughs> Let's see if I can get some more bricks. We've got some lighter weight now, have we? Yeah, a little bit. Excellent. A little bit nicer. So let's have a little go. Oh, look at that. Looks straight in there. Well, almost. Oh, it's all the way, isn't it? It's one thing, too, isn't it? Yeah, that's it. Okay. It's still not finger tight. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you got it? Yeah. Oh, I can see the way you're handling it now. That's coming off. 
Yeah. So now, slide it through. And then, drop it through on that. Slip it from that. Right now, what we need to do is, I want to put that in. Yep. Right. I've completely split apart. in there, Paul. Hardly surprising. I guess we can push that thing out again. Alex, can you hold on to that spanner? <laughs> hold on to the spanner? Just on the air, because I can't do both. Yep. So you better do it. Thank you. Right then. <coughs> Put back. And then we've got those. Is that one? Shame we can't get a gun in here, really. Somebody put a load of protection on the bottom of the chassis without any cutouts for anything useful like ripping the body off. Do you not think about that when you put that on? <laughs> <laughs> were you actually mine, naively mine, fully mine. <laughs> Well, I'm just wondering if you were fully expecting the body to stay on forever. Well, I must admit, I hadn't, I hadn't thought about taking it off. <laughs> oh, look at that. We have one of our little bolts undone. Um, that makes two. So you've done one, yeah. and I've done one, Rust. two, three, four, five, seven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And how many brakes have you gone done? Yeah. Oh, don't. One. Whatever. Seven. Carry on. Yeah. Carry on. Yeah. <laughs> Do not want to hold you up? Not Thank you. Ed, have you got a minute? What's up, sir? I mean, I get I'm just looking at this uh, outrigger here. So you can see, so yeah, so that bit, so the nut, or the, the, top, the head of the bolt is actually rotted away. Yeah. Um, I don't know, are we going to be able to cut that with a sawzall maybe? But actually when you look at it, it's not actually attached to the outer sill anyway. Oh, so this bit here, yeah, it's missing. It's the inner sill, it's not, it's just, yeah, it's missing. So actually, thing. that's great, that saved us a job, so this chassis isn't attached to the body. No, so the body just come off and we can deal with the, the bush and the bolt later. Fantastic, okay, let's move on, wonderful. I still need some new gloves. And you promised me some Black Friday deals from Ansel. Indeed I did. And if you check the description below, you'll actually find some fantastic deals from Ansel. Oh, got they look really good. Yeah. Right, let's crack on with the last of the body mounts. Alex, can you just get hold of that spanner and try and make sure it stays on the top of the bolt? Yep. That's lovely. Got it. Awesome. It's moving, it's now on touching the side of the bodywork. Who right. made these things so long? <laughs> that might be worth, um, if, you, if you've got all that completely. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, push well, it against the bodywork and then... Okay. If they can see the inner wing flexing <laughs> under the power. <laughs> So is this the last bolt now then, I think? No, there's one more, the same one over the other side. Okay. I'll leave that one to Alex and Adam. There we go. Well done, sir. Okay, let's see if we can get this one on then. Oh. <laughs> and she's off. Mm. That's just rounding off. I think it might have been. Mm. Again, I don't, I don't actually know if it's connected. It'd be different if you brought it in for the app. Yeah. But you didn't. I mean, it's connected here, but it Where? might just... No, I, I love it. Yeah. Is that another one going to go? Yeah. When in doubt, use a brummy <laughs> screwdriver. Yeah, that doesn't need to come undone there. <laughs> there we go. What Johnny, did you say, he's, Paul? Johnny's ruining your Range Rover. <laughs> Another issue averted. <laughs> he's, he's ruining your Range Rover. <laughs> really? 
I hope you're not That's disconnected. getting my Axminster carpet all <laughs> grubby. <laughs> done. That's bold. Well, John, it looks like you've done loads of previous welding in the past, but it's a shame that all the plates you've put on have rusted through again. Yeah, obviously I didn't use thick enough plate. No, you didn't. Wow, and there's just loads and loads of rust. What a shame. We're going to have to fix that. That's going to please Ed. Ah, oh, well, it's good, for the, it's good for the welder. I think it's going to be good with lots of other things as well when this is finished. <laughs> well, hopefully I'll have fully mastered the art of delegation by then. Anyway, stop finding new holes to poke in John's rusty Range Rover and get on with repositioning the arms of the ramp so we can finally start lifting the body off the chassis. <laughs> Okay, chaps, everybody get a corner. So this is finally the moment of truth. We are now going to try and separate the body from the chassis. Hopefully, we have got everything we think we need to get. There's bound to be a one cable, there usually is, but let's give it a go. So you ready? Go. Everybody yep. see your side? Yep. Yep. Here we go. Yep. Is that, is that all Moving. good? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, slowly. Yeah. So that's looking pretty good. How are we doing at the back? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, all good. <laughs> oh, one second. Good. One second, I'm one, I'm one, one second. seconding. Hang on, hang on. I've got a loom tight here at the back. Can I go down a bit? Yeah. I think it's just bolted to the back of the engine on a bracket and that's it. You see it there, Paul? Yeah, I can see it, yeah. just. It's always one, there's always yeah. one. Just that one harness there, look onto the back of the cement head. Okay. What do we need? Uh, tin, tin snips. <laughs> <laughs> And that it looks like a little bit like an eight mil. Yeah, I'll go with that. Something. Oh. Some with long arms. Who could that? Who could that be? Yeah. So here we are. So we've now basically got most of the stuff undone. But there is what we're just undoing now is a kind of a big P clip right here. And there's this cable that goes obviously all the way around the wiring. It's for the injectors and everything else. And it goes in through here. Now Adam is just fettling away to see if he can find a way of getting the cables out. Look at that, so we've got a few little bits and pieces here. Hopefully, this is all going to go to the brain. Can you push that? Yeah, that's it. Lovely. A little bit more. <laughs> that's the one. That's the one. That's the one. <laughs> Try not to leave your fingers attached. That's good. That's good. That's good. Ooh. Oh, lovely, 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 lovely. Keep it coming, keep it coming. Keep it coming. <laughs> Is this going to the boot of the car? Oh, here we go. So this is the relays now, is it? Relay bases are going to come through first. Yeah. Yep. Lovely. Smashing. One more, is there? Yep. And then you've got the ECU connectors to really gently through the bolt. Okay. Oh, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. So that's it. So that is our wiring out of the way. And so now with all of that removed, we're definitely now in a good place, I think. The only thing, the fuel lines are attached down to the actual chassis, aren't they? So that's okay. So here we go. Everybody man their stations again. Yeah, I'm keeping an eye on the front. Right, ready? Here we go. Second time lucky. Ready? Yep. yep. Oh. Alex, can you see the fuel lines? Are they okay? They're free? Yeah. The ones at the back of the front here, the ones going on the side? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wait, hold on a minute. You got issues? I think it's attached by a cable tie at the. Uh, Unattach it immediately. Um, there we go. Is that going to do it? I've got one cable that's just jamming at the back of the engine somewhere. I can't oh. see. What's, is that one more or is it just in a bundle? It's in a bundle. It's an abundance of bundles. So that's that, and then that is oh, the, is it just the breathers? cable. Yeah, so that's the breathers. What's that one, sorry? What's the speedo that? cable? That? Speedo cable, this is the speedo cable. Okay, so that's disconnected. Cool, anyway, carry so on, carry yeah. on. How are you good, are you good there? Yeah, yep. all good. Yep. All good, yeah, here yeah. we go, more. Yep. yep, more. Third time lucky. Oh, I 
can hear crispiness. What's that? So is that the, handbrake cable? Is the handbrake cable. Is that? Is it just stuck on a little peak? Yeah, hang on. I'll go down a little tiny bit, and then if you can dive in. Yep. Hang on, there's a bit yeah. more. Just push it down and out, I think. Lights. <laughs> okay, okay, Adam, can you see that? Can you reach? Yep, yeah, I can reach it now. It's yep. just that little hook. <laughs> there we go. Brilliant, well done, yeah, fantastic. Off. Okay, carry on, lovely. <laughs> okay, so fourth time lucky, I think, or is it fifth already? I don't know, I think probably fourth. Here we go. How are we doing? Oh, 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 got it. Yeah. yeah? Yeah, 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 sorry, yeah, got it. I mean, that's pretty good. Oh, look I at would that. say. We have guaranteed total separation. Look at that. Fantastic. I think a round of applause. Yeah. <laughs> well done, everybody. Well done, chaps. That was quite a job. So all we have to do is just roll out the chassis, and then we can put this somewhere safe. I think there's a metal bit in the yard. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, that was a good old day's work, but there we are. <laughs> there we went. There we go. Oh, be careful when it goes over the ramp. Look at that. It's lovely. <coughs> Oh. Moves much better without the body. It does, doesn't it? Oh, there we go. <laughs> well, it did turn out to be an absolutely mammoth task, but made a lot easier by having a gang of guys to give me a hand. So we now have separated the body from the chassis. All we have to do now is strip it all down, refurbish it all, put it all back together again, and then we'll have a working, drivable Range Rover. Right, well, today we're going to continue dismantling our Range Rover. Having removed the body, we can now turn our attention to just stripping down that chassis, just get rid of absolutely everything. Now, we've always said that it's in quite good nick. It's just covered in loads of surface rust and loads and loads of mud and sand and grit, all that stuff that John's been throwing up when he's been driving around off-road. Now, you can see even my lovely refurbished fuel tank got sullied when we took off the body, so that's all going to come off eventually, but we need to clean it first. Pretty much everywhere you look, there are clumps of mud and dirt that's kind of accumulated over time. There is so much stuff attached to this chassis that just shouldn't be there. And there's even part of the body still attached here, <laughs> so I don't know what we're going to do with that. No, absolutely, and to get that off, it's going to be much easier to see what we've got to play with once the whole chassis is clean. But you can see, again, when all the oil has been leaking out of the transmission, it's kind of congealed with all the mud and made this kind of horrible black concrete we're going to have to sort of chisel off with a jet washer. And then on the back, or the top of the bell housing here, you can see, again, all the oil has been leaking out of the engine, and it's covered. I couldn't get to that when I was steam cleaning the underside of the Range Rover, so all that's going to be very satisfying to get rid of that. Now, perhaps the hardest thing we're going to tackle today is hoiking out the engine and the transmission, because let's face it, everything else is just going to drop off. Paul, what are you doing? I'm just covering up all the orifices. Nice thought. OK, of course. And then when it comes to actually cleaning this thing, we're going to need a bit more extra help on here, aren't we? We are. I think maybe some degreaser. And then I think we leave it on there for maybe 10, 15 minutes. A mm -hmm. little bit of agitation, what do you reckon? Nice. And then we give it a jet wash. Yes, but not on this workshop floor, so let's get it out of the workshop. Let's do it. <laughs> Should we do this? Nice. My first shiny bit. Look at that.
Should we call it a night? Well, I certainly can't see any more dirt. While that chassis is drip drying in the yard, we need to dispose of a body. Shall I go and get some shovels? No, I think we'll use a chassis jig. Sounds like a plan. Yeah. Ooh, yeah. Okay, now, hang on. Hang Let's on. not spill the tea. Quite important. In fact, we're going to have to put them somewhere else. Oh, there we go, a bit more. Ease this into position. I guess it's what? A bit more? Yeah. Right, now. So, the only thing that's holding this thing up at the moment are John's little rock sliders, or whatever you want to call them. So, obviously, we need to sort of use some metal to hold those in position. And, of course, this end is heavier than that end, right? Sorry. Definitely, yeah. Let's swap so, poles. hang on. Yeah, this one's a lot thicker gauge. Yeah. So, you take that one there. And I'll take that one. So, pop it over the top because otherwise we're not going to get it out or up. So, theoretically, now when we lower this down, the weight will be supported on these little chaps and then our body will be levitating, or at least sitting on the chassis jig. That's the plan. What are our chances? <laughs> no, it's good. All right, cool. Let's give it a go. Down we go. Slightly intrigued by the fact we're going to have to find a way of getting this onto a spit. Yeah, I'm not too sure how we're going to do that. I, I think the old-fashioned way is probably a mattress and then we roll <laughs> it onto a mattress. Because obviously, well, I don't think we've got to worry too much about damaging any bodywork. We can't do that. I think I still think the door hinges might be clever. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Looking at the bottom of these two A-pillars, I don't think that's a good idea. Well, uh, maybe. Right now, how are we... All right, hang on a sec. Let's just have a little, um, little shift. Mine could go back a little tiny bit, I think. I'm OK here. Looking terrible. No, it's looking pretty good. Okay. Yeah, okay. You happy with that? Yeah. <laughs> Do worry. Right, so if we've successfully separated the body from the ramp, we can now think about starting to roll it, I guess. I think just before we do that, um, I just want to get a couple of G clamps and just secure that box section yep. to the chassis jig. Good thinking. So, are you ready? Yeah. Now, actually, what I want to do, I just want to stop when we get. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Okay. I'm just going to just lift it up over the. Yeah, that's a good idea. I don't, I don't want the ramp. You know, I don't want that little bump because obviously it's not designed for off road, this thing. <laughs> Even if the Range Rover is. Right, try that. I'm not sure it's going to work. Nearly. <laughs> okay, yeah. that'll be yeah. enough. You're clear. <clears throat> so we could keep going, we couldn't we just get a bit more, it doesn't have to go over at all. So keep pushing. <laughs> <laughs> it's not gonna go, is it? All right, hang on. There we go. Okay. Right, forward. Okay, ready? Yep. Right, and swing it around. Lovely. Oh, look at that. <laughs> and then backwards. Oh, 
there we go. Well, that is the body safely buried away. So now we can crack on with the chassis. Let's get it on the ramp. We should definitely power these things. Yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> Right. So, I think for now, we'll just lift it on the same kind of positions we have been doing as before. Just a little bit easier. Just like a nice bit of flat. Yeah, good. perfect. Go. Oh, hang on. Slightly squiffy. Perfect. Yep. Yep. Cool. Right then, after all that huffing and puffing, we've now got our chassis on the ramp, so we're ready to take it apart. Now, the first thing we're going to do is try and remove the engine. I think probably the best thing to do, Paul, is probably just lift it right up and actually undo everything from underneath. So things like the starter motor, the engine mounts, obviously all the torque converter bolts. I mean, there's a lot of stuff to undo, isn't there? There is. I think before we do that, why don't we get some penetrating fluid and just go around and spray everything? That is a good plan. OK. Good idea, sir. Go for it. Right, let's get busy. Wow, have you seen this pinion? Look how much plays in it. That is a little terrifying. Actually, it's quite a good time to do that. So clearly we are going to have to rebuild the rear, the rear diff. I suspect the front might be just as bad, but that's quite a pretty bad that's, indication. That's of... pretty bad. I haven't seen one like that before, I must admit. <laughs> it's all that rock crawling again. This all right, is... another job for the list. <laughs> Let's crack on. Right then, so we need to start taking some things apart. We'll start with some big lumps, obviously the engine and the gearbox want to come out, but I think it is going to be easier if we separate them, isn't it really? Yeah, definitely, because we're going to build the engine and then obviously we need to sort the issues out in the gearbox. I think having two kind of lumps rather than one big one is going to be a lot easier. And yeah. it's also going to be a lot easier to disconnect the torque converter and Absolutely. everything else in this position. Because that is the thing, we've got a lot of fluidy stuff to worry about. So even though we've disconnected these trans cooler pipes from the trans cooler itself, so the transmission cooler, basically they are still attached to the engine in a couple of places and obviously they could easily get damaged and then there'll be fluid leaking all over the place. So I think we'll actually disconnect those and remove them all the way from the assembly so they're just not in the way. But then talking of further fluid, as Paul suggests, Obviously, we've got our torque converter in here. We know about that. We've actually got that attached to the flex plate, which, of course, is bolted to the engine. And so rather than chuck fluid all over the place from that as well, and also risking damage in the seals on the torque converter, at least on the gearbox, then what we want to do then is actually disconnect it from the flex plate. So we'll open this little hole here again. That is where our biscuit of unpleasantness was before. And also, we'll probably take off this front plate as well, give us a bit more access, and then we can unbolt torque converter from the flex plate then we can push that torque converter into the bell housing that's going to give us a bit more safety a bit more space which would be nice so that would be one less thing to leak all over the floor but then also talking about fluid still we've then got the power steering fluid as well haven't we yes we have so and i guess we, we can and then we need to sort the exhaust out as well yeah well the exhaust is another thing because we have obviously here we've got our sort of cast collectors going into these sort of secondaries here, this two into one pipe, then goes off into the rest of the rusty old exhaust system. So we are going to upgrade these into some kind of tubular headers at some point to give it a bit more sportiness, and it's going to sound better as well, of course, it's going to perform better. So really, these are scrap. And also, you imagine if we leave them attached here, they're actually going to make it harder to get past the gearbox when we take the engine out. So we might actually either unbolt them, because there are 
sort of three bolts from the top there onto that manifold, but of course they're notoriously rusty, notoriously difficult to disconnect. So we might end up cutting the exhaust just to give ourselves a bit more space. So I think, shall we start with the torque converter? Sounds like a plan. Cool. Well, well that is for that little centre plate. Thank you. Do you think we're going to get that off without moving the sump out of the way? Gasket. So with the cover now out of the way, we can see a whole load of bolt heads, but actually it's not those that we're looking for. The ones we want are just up there through the little holes in the flex plate. And I can feel, well, I guess it must be probably a, a 17 mil head there. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna try and crank around the engine. So pop that in the end and then try and get it into a good position. <laughs> nice and easy, right, so, oh, there we go, right, so now I've got a hole pretty much at an edge, so if we now get this through, do you reckon that's going to work? Yeah, I think it should. Oh, a tiny bit more. Yeah, you're right. on it. That's good, so now what we need to do is another thing. Stop the engine rotating. Get a pry bar and then we're just going to whiz this up there, like that. Should be able to do this. Oh, there we go. Not quite sure how they put this together, but probably not like this. All right, there we go. There we go. Nice, there we go. Nice and easy. <laughs> kind of. Oh, so hopefully. There we have it. Oh. Oh. Okay, hopefully one more to go. Yeah, theoretically there should only be three, but we'll see how we go. Yeah, so those bolts are basically just holding that ring gear for the starter onto the flex plate, aren't they? You think they normally weld it, wouldn't you? They normally are welded. Okay, so I think that is the last bolt. So the next thing, we're just, we're just going to just push that torque converter, make sure it goes all the way into the bell housing towards the gearbox. How should we do it with that? And I just try and pull this away from the flex plate into the gearbox. Oh yes. With that done, I start to remove the pipes that carry the transmission fluid from the gearbox to the cooler positioned at the front of the vehicle. While Paul gets on with separating the exhaust system from the cast iron manifold. Oh dear, there seems to be some of that chocolate sauce still in the gearbox. This should now be, just wiggle them through. <laughs> right, so that is the transmission cooling pipes out of the way. So the last thing underneath, I think, are the engine mounts.
But we're making quite good progress here. So the next stage, now everything underneath has been undone. We've still got to disconnect the power steering and we've got to disconnect the bell housing of the gearbox from the engine. There's a load of bolts that go from this side all the way around to the other side. There's an earth strap, a couple of little bits and pieces, and then we're hopefully going to be good to actually lift it out of the chassis. So it's getting quite good. So yeah. I've, I've just got the, uh, the high pressure and the uh, return to the pump here. I'm just going to uh, disconnect those, but I'm going to put a tray under there first because I'm sure there's going to be some fluid. Good thinking. Cool. That's going to come out. I'm doing that one a little bit, but I'm going to leave it bolted up for now. So I think this is it. This is the last one. Right, so that now is the last bolt. So the next thing we're going to do is actually try and lift the engine, start to pull it away, separate it from the gearbox. But before we do, with that last bolt still attached, I'm just going to take the strain, get a little wedge, a bit of wood, underneath well, the gearbox basically between that and the cross member and that way it's just going to give it a little extra bit of support and then we should be able to more easily pull the engine away from the gearbox right then paul let's get our engine crane in right, I'll just drop it down a bit okay so now thankfully the way this engine is put together, it actually comes with two little engine or well, lifting eyes, which is great. What are you doing? I'm on. So, makes it a lot easier to get out. I guess they expect people to be working on them all the time. Right, so just now I'm just going to take it the strain, just going to lift it up. Oh. Enough. And now we're just going to pop that little bit of wood or something underneath. What do you reckon? How about that big? Oh, perfect. So let's drop it down again just to get it in position. So we could do the honours with the uh, last bolt. Now it's going to take a little bit of wiggling, but we should now be able to wrestle the engine from the transmission. So I might drop it down a tiny bit as well. Okay. I think you need to go up. I sure, no, we are going to have to go with Yeah, go up. So we might need a bigger bit of wood, actually. Ready? Yeah. A bit more. Okay. Well, I'm just going to wind this back a little bit first, just so we've got a little bit more weight supported at this end. Right. Should we wiggle? There we go. Oh. Awesome. So now, how are we doing? So it's 
kind of levitating, which is good. Yeah. So now if we just pump it up. Up we go. A oh. bit more. No, that was it. <laughs> okay, pull it back. And drop it down a bit. Okay. Looking quite unreasonable. Have a filter. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I'll lift it and get past there. Yeah. I'll just give it a little bit more height. We're kind of at the end of the engine hoist, but that's enough, hopefully. Whew. Well, look at that. Wow. Our V8 has been separated from the chassis. I think we've done very well, so that's very good. So now that's done, all we've got to do is the gearbox and transmission, the exhaust system, the suspension, all those fiddly little brackets that are gonna be a real pain to get off, but they have to come off. And all of that, I think, is a job for another day. Now, out of my selection of mostly not working Range Rovers, this is currently my daily driver, because it does work, and it's a 2011 model. And that means it's got a few more electronics on it than you'd normally have on my previous older versions. Now, that's some nice toys that you get with that. You get the lenticular TV screen, which is great, so the passenger can watch TV while you're watching sat-nav while you're driving along, which is very cool. It's also got keyless ignition, which means I've got a button on the dash to start and stop the engine, and that is where I have my intermittent problem. And it seems to be somehow connected to basically the voltage, but also temperature. Because on occasion, between sort of naught and five degrees, for no particular reason at all, when you push the start button, the car just sits there and does absolutely nothing. No error messages or anything, it just doesn't start. Now, the first thing on this car is actually got a sensor on the battery lead to tell the car how much voltage it's got. So I've changed that just to make sure that that isn't the problem. So I've connected up my voltmeter so I can see what voltage we've got at the battery, which is currently about 12.4 volts. But now I wanna know what the car thinks it's got as voltage at the battery. So to do that, I've got this clever little thing called a Carly. Now Carly are actually sponsoring some of this episode, which is very good of them. But just to explain what it is that they do, they have a little device here, a little gizmo that goes into your OBD2 socket. So I just plug that in like so, and then turn on the ignition. I can then connect up the app to the device, excuse the bonging, and now we should then be able to start talking to the car and we have a whole load of functions we can actually have a look at. We can look at all the error codes that might come up, we can clear those error codes, we can also check sort of the health of the vehicle if you like, but the thing I'm really interested in here is the live data. So I click on the live data, connect to that, and eventually it's gonna give me a big list of all these things that I could actually choose. And what I obviously want to know is the voltage that I'm looking at, so I'm gonna click on the voltage on the live data and you can see here that now obviously with the ignition on I've actually got 12.06 volts currently whereas our voltmeter clearly says it's 12.12 .12 volts so there's obviously a discrepancy you expect that a little bit but it might be the case that when the temperature changes or the humidity changes or something a sensor then starts to give out a funny reading when then maybe this discrepancy gets greater and then the car won't start because it doesn't think we've got enough energy to actually get the car started. So next time my intermittent fault happens and I can't start my car, I'll make sure I've got the Carly and my voltmeter with me and I can then check that discrepancy on the voltage and hopefully it will lead me down that path to finding a solution. Range Rovers are notoriously reluctant to talk to the outside world. Normally you would need an OEM spec diagnostic tool to get to the depths of what's going on inside your car, but at least with the Carly you get some kind of insight. Now on a car like Paul's 2005 Series 1 BMW, you get a whole load of extra things in the customization department, which is very exciting. So I'm just gonna click through to that. Now in this particular car, we've got eight ECUs we can be talking to, which is great. So I'm just gonna check those possibilities. And now it's just going through and having a little scan around the brain just to see what I can mess around with with Paul's vehicle. It's bound to be some features we don't need. So for example, if we have a look at the locking and comfort functions, so I'm just gonna to have to download that. So it's gonna save those settings so I don't mess them up too badly. We can always go back. And it's very happy with the backup. So now we can have a look at that. We see all these different functions here. You can see we can play around with. So all the things to do with the comfort key connection, so you can turn them on or off. 
And then you've got things like one, obviously, when you actually lock the vehicle, whether the doors or the windows can still be shut down. So here, for example, so power windows after ignition off, that's currently on. I think it'd be much more inconvenient if we put it to off. So let's do that, lovely. Easy entry, let's definitely keep that off because we don't want to make it any easier for him. What else could we do here? Now this app actually works on both Android and Apple phones or Apple devices, which is rather cool. Now currently you've got things like the, the front fog lights with the high beams. So I can actually, that's currently off. I could turn that back on just so he's a bit more annoying on the road. That's lovely. And then interior lighting off after two minutes. That's currently on. Let's make sure it's nice and dark. So let's turn that off. As you can see, there are just so many features that can be unlocked with this coding section, particularly with this kind of vehicle. So you can have hours and hours of fun. Or well, in this case, of course, I can just turn all kinds of stuff off just to make it rather difficult for Mr. Brackley. Paul, I fixed your car. I didn't know there was uh, anything wrong with my car, but uh, cheers anyway. <laughs> now, if you fancy one of these handy little gizmos, then Carly have two to give away. All you have to do is like the video and then leave a comment with hashtag Carly. Good luck. One of these could be winging its way to you any second now. Now, whether you enter the competition or not, you can still be a winner because Carly will give you 15% off if you buy one using the link in the description below. Oi, what have you done to my car? Right, well, let's crack on with the de-rusting of our chassis. Now, obviously, we want to be able to get to the top, the bottom, the outside, the inside of the chassis rails. And for that, it'd be much easier if we could rotate the chassis into any position. And for that, it'd be very handy if we had a rotisserie. Handily, we've got this bad boy from Frost. Right, so all we have to do now, Paul, is work out how we're actually going to attach the rotisserie to our chassis. Yeah, well, there's quite a few options. There's a bracket down here, there's another big hole here, but I think this little body mount here is probably favourable. That's a good idea, Paul. We've got some of those lugs at this end as well, and as you say, they're obviously designed to hold the body onto the chassis, so they should be strong enough to hold the chassis onto our rotisserie. Anything is, I think it might be worth making some spacers just to go between the chassis and our spit here, just to make sure when we're getting in there with the laser, we don't burn any paint off. Right, well, I found myself a bit of tubing. It's perfect for the spacers, except for the fact the hole in the middle is a bit big inside. But I've also found myself a slightly smaller bit of tubing, which is the perfect diameter for then the bolt to go inside that. So I'm just going to cut four lengths of each of those, maybe even tack them together. And we're going to get a nice secure connection between the chassis and our little rotisserie. So we've now got our spacers, a little bit over-engineered perhaps, but better safe than sorry. Now they're going to sit there and there, and now we're going to have to attach the rotisserie to our chassis. But something to bear in mind is that the axis of that bit of rotation there should be going through the centre of gravity of our chassis, because that way when we rotate it, whatever position it goes into, it would be nice and balanced. And at the moment, that's not really going to work out unless we actually use the adjustability of the rotisserie to actually spin things into different positions. So if I just rotate this round like so and pop it back into position. Right, so we can now see that our chassis is already looking much more in line with that axis there, but also we can fine tune sort of the height of this part 
by moving that lead screw. So let's just get that into position. Put up the pin, and just drop it down a little bit. Okay, so that goes through there like so. So that's now pretty much in position. That's good. So we now have pretty much central, isn't it, here? More or less. Just, uh, that's good. Yeah. Yep. Smashing. So tighten that up again. So it's nice that it's very adjustable because obviously we can make this fit all kinds of things. Whether it's going to be bodies, chassis, or who knows what next. Maybe a boat. So then, this end is pretty much there, at least certainly ready for the first go. The only thing I will adjust is we'll adjust the lead screw here, but once we've got the other end in position, so we can just get that centre of gravity into the right place. There we go. Fab. Awesome. Okay. To the other end. Right, so it's pretty much the same procedure on the rear end of the vehicle. So what we'll do is we'll just spin this around again. There we go. Like that, I guess. Roll that in. Give it to be a little bit wider this time. And then we'll just lower it down as well. And then, once it's connected up, we'll still probably just lift the whole chassis up a little bit, just because I think it's going to be still a little bit off centre. Should I go back a bit, actually? Up there. Now, this particular rotisserie can handle about 4,000 pounds, which is about what, 1,800 kilograms or so. So, if you imagine, I don't know what a Range Rover is, about two and a half tonnes or something, probably with all the bits in. So, this is going to be more than capable of handling both the body on its own and the chassis on its own. It's looking good. The interesting thing, of course, is we're going to have to make sure that we get our two little bits that are rotating in exactly the right height, whatever happens. Otherwise, of course, it's going to be all over the place. Right, so now everything's bolted up. All we have to do now is actually just lift that chassis just a little bit using this lead screw to get that center of gravity of the weight pierced by that sort of axis of rotation. Now, obviously, when you look at it at the moment from this end, you can see it sort of seems in pretty good shape. But actually, when you look at it from the side, you can then see, because of the kind of bananaing of that chassis, then you can see it definitely needs to come up a little bit because clearly most of the weight is still at the bottom. Thankfully, it's quite easy to adjust. Well, it's taken a while, but we are getting there. Paul, can you give us a hand with the other end? Sure. Thank you, sir. Oh, nice. Let's take a while. How are you getting on there, Paul? Yeah, pretty good. Well, of course, obviously, the, the, I guess the chassis was always in this orientation on the car, wasn't it? So I reckon I've got another couple of inches to go. And then I think I need to jack it up. Yep. With the hydraulic ram, get it higher. I think I'm lowering you. I think a tiny bit more, but it's definitely, definitely getting there. Right, that should be it. So now, if you look through 
that axis and then through the chassis, sort of project it through, you can see it's kind of much closer to the centre. There's a, pretty much as much chassis on the top as there is on the bottom of that imaginary line. And by the time we've actually lifted up Paul's axis so they actually match, we should be spot on. So go on then, Paul. Jack her up. OK, I'm the same as you now, mate. Fantastic. Well, there we go. So now, if you just lock that up, yep, that'd sure. be wonderful stuff. And then I can lower the ramp just a little tiny bit and we'd be good to go. Right then, so we now should be pretty well balanced. We can always tweak this as we go along. Are you ready, Paul? Should I'm we give ready. it a go? Should we rotate this round? Here we go. It's not bad. That's not too bad, is it? So let's go back to what, vertical, just for fun. Right there. Look at that. Well, I think we're ready for the laser. Now this is the Naran Rod 1000. It's a 1000 watt pulsed laser from the Czech Republic and it can clean pretty much anything. Thanks for stopping by the workshop. If you enjoyed the video even just a little bit, then click like. If you hated it, well then click like three times. Also remember to leave your thoughts and your questions in the comments. And obviously we'd love to see you again soon. So please remember to click subscribe if you haven't already and click the bell for notifications of when the next video is published or when I have some intriguing news.